critical elements of closing. First of all, you have to have leadership, which everybody knows, but in parentheses next to leadership, right? Moral authority. Like imagine like the concrete pillars that you have on the side of the highway so you don't run the road or run a car off the road. Does that make sense? That would be like, that would be an example of force because like you can't put enough force on it to break it. And then a police officer standing in front with his hand in front of a, that can stop a giant semi. There's no force there, but there's power. The semi could literally run over the man, but they stop because he has power. The force isn't, isn't what's causing the truck to stop. It's the power behind it. And so with sales, this is why we call moral authority and leadership, they're tied together, because you can't make another person do something. But if you can create a position of power, then you can lead them to do something. So you guys may have experienced this on a, on a call where it's like, uh, how many of you were convinced on your strategy session with us that our salesperson legitimately wanted what was best for you? Most people. And the people who didn't raise your hands, we need to know who the closer was. Because that, that's a problem. So when, a couple, a couple quick rules here. When someone believes you have their best interest in mind, you, they loan you the ability to influence their decisions. Not permanently, because you're not their mother, and they're, you're not their friend, but for a period in time, they're gonna give you the ability to tell them what to do, and they're gonna honor that. Have you ever felt like you're being sold and it's sleazy? And it doesn't matter what they tell you to do, like you will not do it. You are going to do the opposite, no matter what. You've revoked their ability to influence your decision. So, number one with moral authority is the person has to believe. This, this is going back to what has to be present to do sales well. There has to be uh, preeminence in that they truly believe you have their best interests in mind. That has to happen from the very beginning. The very beginning. That's why you'll hear us start calls. If it's going to be listening to the recording of one of my calls. So most calls, here's how it goes. Hey, how's it going? I'm going to ask you some questions and figure out if this is something that's good for you. If it's not, I will tell you that and then tell you to do something different. Why do I say that? I don't care what they do. I just want them to make the right decision for them. And so that's from the very beginning. I'm not going to let any time go by without them acknowledging that. And it's actually true. You know, you're a bad, like you're a bad person if you say this, but you don't believe it. Like that's, you're a scammer. But I think everybody in this room is like, you actually care about your clients, like legitimately. And so, but that needs to be said. Remember we talked about yesterday, just because you're good at something doesn't mean people recognize it. Just because you care doesn't mean people know that. So you got to tell them. Uh, when we have new closers, the biggest issue that we have to fix, the biggest issue by far is that they will just assume the prospect knows something and they won't sell, they won't tell them. The prospect, even if the prospect knows, they still need to hear it. All right, so you gotta have to have their best interest, that's step one, and then they have to feel like you understand them. What's more important? If you're married, what's more important? Or if you have a significant other, understanding your significant other or them feeling like you understand your, them, which is, so like I'm a guy, obviously, and there are so many times when we were first married that Chris had to mentor me through, where my wife is telling me about a problem, and like, I get it, like I know exactly what she needs to do, and I'm like, here's, babe, just stop, here's exactly what you need to do, and like, why are you saying it, just don't say that, and we in this massive fight, because she doesn't care like what I think, she wants me to, she wants to know that I understand what she's saying. It's the same with prospects. You can know that a person has a family because they put it on their application. But when you ask them, do you have a family? And they get the ability to tell you that they have a family. All of a sudden, because they're, they're talking to you and you're listening, that's why we ask questions that we know the answer to all the time. It's not to under, it's not to get the answer of the question is to communicate to the prospect that you actually understand them. Uh, because sometimes you'll get on a call with someone and they can know what you need to do, but if they just talk the whole time and they never listen, you're not gonna feel like they understand you. Preeminence, best interest, they have to feel understood. Number two. And then they have to believe in the solution. I mean, that's like obvious, but the first thing we work on when you come in is your offer. There's a reason for that. Because if your offer is not succinct, 
and clear, then what will happen is people won't be able to wrap their head around it and believe it. And that's why our offer is four steps. That's why you'll see us talk about like three to five steps. It's way easier to believe that something can help you if you feel like you understand it. It's obvious, but people skip over this. So if your offer is abstract and too wide and people can't figure out how it's actually going to make a difference for them, they won't buy from you because they don't feel like it's going to, they don't have faith in the solution. Make sense? Anything to add to that? Yeah, just to kind of like tie those two together, people want to feel understood. It's human nature. And they want to understand. Right? It's like nobody wants to feel alone. And that's a part of feeling understood. Right? If you understand me, then I don't feel alone in whatever it is I'm dealing with. Right? And then the process of getting them over the hump and actually working with you is them understanding how you help them through that. Cool. Silence. What did, what do most people do if you're in a conversation with them and they get really uncomfortable? They speed up, they start talking more and more and more. Why is that? Anybody know? Deflection. If we can talk, there's noise and nobody's paying attention to what we're uncomfortable about. And so when I get in a room with somebody or on the phone with somebody and someone says, Oh, I can't I can't afford that. And everybody feels awkward right about now. You feel the uncomfortableness? Like, there's nowhere to hide. There's no, there's nowhere. And what what will happen is someone will feel that they'll fill that that void with the real answer, which is not that they can afford it. It's that their kid is sick and they just got evicted and they or they got burned by a coach before. And the real objections come out. And if you solve objections too soon. You answer the wrong objections. If you answer the objections too soon, you answer the wrong objections. And so you have to give enough space for someone to actually get real with you. So anybody know like the number one question we teach people, like the number one question in an objection sequence in sales, what is it? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Like, what do you mean? Let's get everything. Get to the bottom. Get to the bottom of it. Because it's usually, everyone will lead with the, the surface, and you have to get down to the depth of it and deal with the real root issue. And look, sometimes we get to the root issue and someone says, I can't afford it. What do you mean? Or silence. And then they get into the deep issue and it's like, oh, you can't afford it. Like, don't. Don't even buy books. Like, you need to get like, fired for warmth and like get into a shelter or something. Like, we had a sales call with a marketing, a marketing uh, expert who lived in his Toyota. And I figured that out by just shutting up and staying silent at the end. And he couldn't afford it because he didn't have a house to live in. And then my whole posture changed. I'm not trying to get this guy to friggin' buy. The game is not objection handling at that point. It's like, bro, do you have like water and food and stuff? Do you have a credit card? Like it, it just, it changes. And you're not trying to get somebody, it goes back to like doing what's in someone's best interest. So you gotta get to the root objection. So for the silence. How long is too long? 30 seconds is like a bit too long. Okay. Yeah. So, and then if, you are you okay? <laughs> you there? And if a, if a prospect asks you, are you there? The response is, yeah, I'm taking some notes. John some notes down. Knowledge is, knowledge is power. You can't diagnose something. If you go to the doctor and they just give you some pills without figuring out what's wrong with you, like that doctor should go to jail. Like that's malpractice. So it's the exact same thing with this. Like if you're selling something and you don't, and someone's like, I can't afford it. And you don't really know what their situation is. How can you prescribe or diagnose a solution? When right? do you know when like not to be silent, but instead go after things that you sense might be a problem. Like if, if someone says that they're, they have a business partner and you get through the whole thing, what, what, at what point do you just say, well, what does your business partner think about this? Do you do that after the offer, before the offer? Um, if you don't care about the sale at all, and you actually have zero attachments and you do not care, what would you do? Probably ask it right up front. That's barometer. That's their barometer. Yeah. So most mistakes that people make in a sales situation is because they're kind of attached to the outcome, and therefore they're they're not objective. 
at the end of the day, the most powerful force in a sales call is someone knowing that you care about them and you can do whatever you want. All right, follow-ups. Does anybody in here remember if you close on the first call? Can you raise your hand? All right, can you guys look around? Not a huge percentage of people, right? Most people require more time. So there's, there's a percentage of people on the very top that are always going to close. They're looking for the solution. They are problem aware and solution aware. Uh, Eugene Schwartz, they are sophisticated to the point where they are looking for you. They see you, they will buy from you immediately. That's a lower percentage. Most people are going to incubate a little bit. Do you change the strategy for the follow-up call or is it the same? It's always just digging in to find whether yes. that's a good fit and find objections. That's it. It's, it's just, it. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because, because like my favorite scenario is when I can talk to somebody and they've already been a memo subscriber and they know and uh, Upper Echelon, you saw the picture I posted a while back I was, where I was messaging with that dude and I was like, I'm going to enroll you if it's a good fit. So don't get on this call unless you're ready. So my favorite scenario is when they already know they're going to enroll if it's a good fit. And I just have to hop on and be like, hey, are you an idiot? Like, can you follow the instructions? You know, do you know how to help people? Are, you know, are you a spammer? I just need to make sure that you're not going to ruin our reputation. And then I can enroll you. But the reality is most people aren't going to be that. Most people don't really know who you are. And so you have to actually do the conversion you have to get them to believe that you're actually credible on that first phone call. Um, and then if you feel like, if you know that somebody's not in the place where they're probably going to enroll, give them the time to, to, to think about it. Are you pitching the offer on the first call and then following up and closing? Or does it work yeah. the other way too? You will lose a lot of people if the second call is positioned as making a decision. That's what a lot of sales gurus will tell you. Yeah, go we'll talk to your spouse and then, and then on the second, come prepared to make a decision. And then if they have any objection at all, they're going to ban you from their phone. They're not going to, they're going to bail because they're going to be embarrassed. And human nature prevents cognitive dissonance. So we are, they're not going to say, hey, I changed my mind when they've just told you for an hour that they are 100% committed. You know what I mean? So the best way to do it is if you do have that second follow-up, it's like, look, talk with the, whoever you need to talk to. You might have more questions. They might have more questions. And let's set a quick time on next Tuesday just to chat about those questions. And, uh, you know, we might decide that it's not a good fit based on those questions. Or we might decide it is a good fit. We'll just have to see. A length of time that you recommend before, um, for that second call. So for that follow-up call that you all have examined after talking to so many people that that reduces the chance that they are going to sign up. Yeah, so that depends on the objection. If they're liquidating stocks and they need money, you, it's going to take three days, four days. Um, if they're doing anything that's going to require longer than a week, you need to grab a deposit probably from them because after a week, people start forgetting about you. So that's why your calendars, we tell you not to set them more than, I think, what is it, four or five days in, in advance? Yeah, because, like, what did you do, you know, last Tuesday morning at night? Nobody knows. So I had, a, I had a strategy session a couple weeks ago, and I was on with, um, with the owner of a company, and it was the second call, I think. Uh, we waited about a month from the last one. He had a lot of stuff going on. And he was a 10 out of 10. We went through the price, everything. He had to talk with his business partner. Uh, I get on the phone with a business partner a couple days later, and uh, he's more of a silent partner and was just a super you know, jerk. Um, and, uh, you know, like, just like lots of, of very complicated stuff. How would you handle um, something like that where there's like a totally new person who like clearly isn't in the business but is, is, is blowing up um, the kind of progress? I, first of all, I think I always advise addressing the issue just straight up. What's his name? Jeff. And what's the other guy's name? Gerard. All right, Jeff, Gerard. Hold up, listen for a second. You guys sound like you live in different universes. So there's a gap between what I talked to Gerard about versus what Jeff is looking for. And that doesn't mean anything's wrong, but you guys need to go get on the same page. That's what I would. I would advise you to get on the same page before making a decision with me. And you know that I'm being legitimate right now because I don't even want your credit card. Like I want you guys to agree. And I'm sensing a little bit of dissonance. Well, what do you mean? 
Well, when I talked to Gerard, here's what happened. And I'm talking to you, and you're kind of rolling over everything with the with the stick. So you guys should chat.